can't tell you how happy Rosalie and I are to be part of this wonderful community. We've been coming here for quite a long time since our daughter Melissa first moved here about some 30 years ago. And uh, we know the town and we know how much it has meant to our sons and daughters and grandchildren. And we know now even better than we have prior to now what a delightful, good, and extremely interesting place it is to live. And certainly it's rich with history and rich with the reminders that we aren't uh, the newest thing on the planet. <laughs> uh, 50 years ago this spring, my first book was published, The Johnstown Flood. 50, there's a new edition coming out that I'm pleased to say. Uh, a, mem a memorial, a commemorative issue of, it, of the book, 50th anniversary. Rosie and I went out to Johnstown to celebrate the publication of the book. And we took our four children with us. And they were still very little. The oldest was 12 and the youngest was five. And we got there and there was a bigger crowd than we ever imagined uh, at the opening of it. And we were a little concerned about how the children would behave or if they could last listening to me go on and on. <laughs> so Rosalie had the stroke of genius to suggest that we put them on stage. So she got some little chairs, the, you know, the tiny little chairs, and made them sit right on the stage looking at the audience. And they were as good as gold. <laughs> so we thought tonight we'd try the same thing. <laughs> Would the four of you stand up, please? Our hope is it will work again tonight <laughs> with all of you watching. Um, some years ago, not long after I finished the Johnstown Flood, we went to a party, a cocktail party on the vineyard one night. And it was um, a very relaxed and good party. We didn't know everybody there. And uh, the host, was taking me or Rosie around to introduce us to them. And we got to one lady. We knew who she was, but we didn't know her. And um, she had a very aristocratic way of talking and of looking at you. <laughs> and our host said, I like, thought you might be interested to know that David's working on a book about the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> And she said, who in the world would want to read a book about the Brooklyn Bridge? <laughs> and I wanted to smash her. <laughs> so I don't remember what I said, but I tried to be a gentleman. We left the party very soon after, and I was venting my anger. I think I was punching the dashboard. As I was and we got back home, pulled into the driveway, and it occurred to me, perfectly good question. Who in the world would want to read a book about the Brooklyn Bridge? And I said to myself and to Rosalie, I would. And that's why I'm writing it. Because I'd like to read that book, and it doesn't exist. And that's essentially what I've been doing ever since. After I finished the Johnstown Flood, and it came out, had two other publishers besides my publisher, Simon Schuster, who came to me. One wanted me to do the Chicago fi uh, fire, and the other wanted me to do the San Francisco earthquake. I thought, damn it, I'm being typecast as Bad News McCullough, and, I, <laughs> and I'm not even 32 or whatever I was. So I thought to myself, I want to do a subject about a symbol of affirmation. We aren't all fools all the time and irresponsible, which is the real cause of the Johnstown Flood. And I had trouble coming up with an idea. And one day at lunch, I was with two old friends, one of whom was an engineer and the other 
a science writer, was down in the lower east side of New York, and we were within fairly short distance of the bridge, and they got talking about the Brooklyn Bridge. And I had, of course, we'd lived in Brooklyn for a while, and right in Brooklyn Heights, and we knew the bridge, we walked on the bridge, walked one of the, ch our first child on a baby carriage on the, on the promenade there. And the minute he, they said that, I thought, that's my subject. So I had a date to meet somebody back at the office. I was working at American Heritage, the old uh, hardbound history magazine with no ads in it, wonderful magazine. <laughs> oh, it was. And I was very privileged to be working there. And I had a, somebody was coming in to see me, and I said, hell with it. I went right to the 42nd Street Library. I think I took those marble stairs three at a time, went to the card catalog, pulled it out for the Brooklyn Bridge, and there were 50 cards in there about the subject. But not one of them described the book I was already block, blocking out in my head. And I knew this is it. Well, I will now tell you the story of what happened next, because I think it's the, it's the essence of what the excitement of this kind of work is. I learned from a man named uh, Vorgut, who was an engineering specialist at the Smithsonian, that there was a collection up at Rutgers, RPI, in Troy, New York, that but Washington Roebling, who was a graduate of Rutgers, had left them. And yeah, I, he didn't seem to know much about this collection, but he told me that it was, he, was, he imagined it was quite good. So one Saturday, Rosalie and I drove up to Troy from White Plains where we were living. It was one of those absolutely crystal fall days. And we were driving along the Hudson River, and it was one of those scenes in a day that made you think that everything was right with the world. And we got there, and because it was a Saturday, and the RPI football game was off campus, there was nobody on campus. So when we went to the library, which was then in an old church, there was only one person on duty, a woman at the desk. And I said, I've come to see the collection. And she said, well, because I'm the only one on duty, I can't go upstairs to show you, but here's the key. As the top of the stairs, third floor, turn left, first door on the left. So we started up the stairs, and as we got higher, the wattage of the lighting diminished, so that by the time we reached the top, it was sort of 40 watt bulb, one 40 watt bulb, and we turned left, and there was this big door, and I didn't know what to expect. I thought probably it'll be a nice room with file cabinets, maybe a work table, and some chairs. We opened the door, and it was a, nothing but a closet. But the closet had shelves all the, all the way from the floor to the ceiling. There was a high ceiling like this one. All absolutely jammed tight with tied up bundles of letters, scrapbooks, photographs, reports, uh, unbelievable. And I said, oh my God. And she said, oh my God. <laughs> she just saw four years disappear. <laughs> so we started taking a look at what was there and it was fantastic. And then we found, we went across the hall and it was just a storage room. The door was unlocked and walked in and lying around on the floor like rolls of old wallpaper were original drawings by, by uh, uh, Washington, to, by uh, Roebling the father and Augustus. And they were original drawings of the bridge but done in different styles. The towers were different in his own hand. And all kinds of other things. I reached up on the top of a shelf where it was just junk piled and pulled down a bundle of notes. And the notes were kept by the older Roebling. In the seances he had, 
where he was making contact with his deceased wife in his own handwriting. And the handwriting was wandering all over the place. I couldn't figure it out. And I realized it was dark in the room where they're having the seance. <laughs> so I got sort of interested in all this. But, oh, and the, 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 the shoelaces that were used to tie the letters up were that old, those old shoelaces that have wax on them. And, and they, you could tell they had never been undone. And on one hand, I was thrilled. And on the other hand, I thought, how could these people be so irresponsible? I mean, my God, look what this is. And I realized that I was pioneering. I, I had to go do this myself. If I told them, why are you doing this? Do you realize you've got a treasure, national treasure? They'd say, all right, come back in two years. We'll have it all sorted out. I thought, no, don't tell them a word. Don't say a word. Thank you very much. Um, so I kept going back and forth to that closet for about three more years. And the more I got into it, the more I realized what a phenomenal accomplishment it was. And all that they didn't expect they would have me hit by. Uh, they thought they knew exactly how to do it. And I should put it, when I say they, I mean Washington Row because the father had died earlier. So he had to take over. And he was in his 30s. And eventually he contracted caisson disease, the bends, and he couldn't leave his room, which was in the top floor of a house on Brooklyn Heights, and he could look out and see how things were going with the telescope from his room. But it was his wife uh, who went out there all the time and who really took over as the boss, as is often the case. <laughs> and I've written about this several times, including Abigail Adams is a stunning example. She's one of the most remarkable people that we've ever had in this country. And <clears throat> I'm very interested in giving people their credit is due, long overdue, and that they can come on stage and be in the, in the best light on stage at high time. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how I work because none of the, I would say almost everyone that I know, uh, meet for the first time, I should say, has really no idea how a book of this kind is written. And that's really true of all of us about somebody's job. You say, well, what do you do? I'm in financial business or I'm a doctor. You say, oh, that must be interesting. And we have no idea what's involved. And um, uh, I've often had, doctors who tend to be, physicians are often very interested in history, which I think is great. But sometimes they'll say, more than once, the doctor will say, well, I like history very much. I like to read history a lot. And someday I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and I always say, well, that's great. Good luck. <laughs> uh, I feel like, oh, well, someday I'm, I feel like I might like to take out an appendix here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and one doctor said, I can teach you how to do that in about three days. <laughs> um, but it's different than most people imagine. Most people imagine the writer's life is isolated, that you're alone, you're in your room where you work, and just you and your book writing away. Well, of course, for some kinds of writing, that's true, particularly fiction, of course. But for the kind of work that I do, you're constantly in need of help, and you're working with other people all the time. Just like the people who work here. And they, they know their way around their subject in a way you don't yet. Particularly if your approach is the same as mine, which is I never have undertaken a subject I knew much about. Now most people who are in history, they have a specialty. Civil War is their specialty. They, it's all they write about or all they want to write about. Um, that has never appealed to me. If I knew all about the subject, I wouldn't want to write the book because it wouldn't be an adventure for me. It wouldn't be a detective case or a journey. And 
when I tell my academic friends, what do you, they say, well, what, are you, what are you working on now? And I say, it's a book about um, Harry Truman. Oh, oh, um, uh, what's your theme? <laughs> I, don't, I, th I don't have any theme. And so I make one up <laughs> and tell them what it is. But it's really not often, not until the very end of the book, or end of the work, that I suddenly realize what the theme is. And that was quite true of the first book, the John Sand Flood. Well, what's your theme? The theme, I realized, was it's dangerous, perhaps even perilous, to assume that people who are in positions of responsibility are behaving responsibly. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. You have to keep watch. You have to make sure they're behaving responsibly. That disaster during which more than 2,000 people were killed, it was the worst disaster we've ever had up until 9-11. That disaster need never have happened. It was all human failure. Pe assuming that this fellow or that group that was responsible was doing their job at several levels, and they weren't. I, um, I've always been interested in titles, and when I finished my Johnstown book. I wanted a great title for it. And I was ready to turn the manuscript in to my editor, who I'd never worked with, the first book. Hadn't heard from him, hadn't talked to him for three years when he first signed up. And I wanted to turn it, and he, Peter Schwede was his name, was a great known in the publishing business for his titles. Uh, the Longest Day about D-Day, that was his title, he came up with it. Blackboard Jungle, famous book, that was his title. So I felt particularly bound to come up with an ingenious title. And I searched through Shakespeare, I looked through the Bible, hunting, hunting, never found anything. And finally, weeks were going by and I felt guilty that I wasn't turning in the book. So I called him, I said, Mr. Schwade, this is David McCullough. I hope, you know, like, do you remember me? He said, oh, he had a way, sort of a Damon Runyon way of talking. I loved him. He said, oh, yeah, how are you doing? I said, um, I finished my book. Oh, glad to hear that. I said, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't think of a title. He said, no problem with about the title for that book. You call it the Johnstown Flood. I said, what were you thinking to call it? One wet Wednesday? <laughs> he, was a, he was something. And you work with your editors and your copy editors, and it's not a, a lonesome thing. When you see the acknowledgment section in the back of a book, uh, particularly of a history or a biography, Every one of the people mentioned in there has really contributed. i give you one other example. When I was working on the Theodore Roosevelt book, I was using the, that machine that used to, uh, what, are the, what are those things called? Um, the, the process of copying. Uh, yeah, mimeograph. Is that right? Yeah. And they're all, uh, I asked my grand grandchildren, my, they don't know what I'm talking about. But I was using that at the Harvard Library to look at uh, Theodore Roosevelt's diaries when he was young. Micro, microfilm, that's it. And he had a crank as she turned, yeah. And I got to one entry in the diary, and it was clear that a, a, he had blacked it out. It was a blot, right, on the one day. And I knew that the one day was the day he learned that his father had died. So I thought he said something and he wants it eliminated, so he's blotted it out. I thought I've got to go see the original. So I think, I can't prove this, but I may be the only person who ever flew to Washington to look at an ink blot. <laughs> I came into the uh, Manuscript Division of the Library of Congress, went up to the desk, and there was this young fellow there who struck me as probably new on the job. And I said, I told him this whole story about how I wanted to see the 
ink blot in the diary. And he said, sir, if you will go back and stay in your seat, I will call somebody else. So I'd already made big work tables and I went back to my seat. And he looked, he said it in a way of, we get somebody like you every once in a while. <laughs> and I don't know quite how to handle it. So I could hear him and then we waited. And then came this tall, thin fellow with a three-piece suit, vest, and the chain for his watch across the vest. And he went over and the, the, the young boy was, and the, and the guy's looking very serious. So he came back around and he stood behind me. He said, what seems to be the problem? So I repeated the whole story. You see this ink blot? I, this was written by Theodore Roosevelt on learning the news of his father's death. And I think that he's blotted something out. And I think, and I was, and as I was talking, he kept lowering his head. And I sat down so he could see closer. And then he said, I said, I'd really like to see what's under that ink blot. And he said, wouldn't that be great? Now that's the attitude that you dream of in a helper, in an archive or a, or a um, library or any place where these old documents are. So he said, I'll get back to you. So he called me about two weeks later, and he said that I have to turn this over to the FBI because they have the best system of all for finding out about something like this. So he called me back, and he said that he had bad news, disappointing news, I said. And the FBI has told us that they, the only way they can find out what's written under there is to destroy the paper, destroy the page, and we can't allow that. I said, well, absolutely right. I understand perfectly. Thank you for trying. He said, I haven't given up yet. He said, I'm going to turn it over to our people. So he called me another couple of weeks. He said, well, we haven't got it all, but we got quite a lot. Mad at myself for getting tight. He'd gone out and gotten drunk. Oh. Touching. And he was a man who never drank. Um, but he was just so disappointed in himself that he did that. And when you find something like that, it's really thrilling. I've never embarked on a subject that I didn't know anything about, during which I, in the process of understanding what happened and to whom and why, when I didn't find something that nobody else had found. I've always had the good luck of uncovering something, and often something quite wonderful. Right now, I'm working on a book, which I'm writing right here in Hingham, at home, our new home, about the pioneers who went out from New England, from, mostly from Massachusetts, to make the first settlement in the Northwest Territory. Now, the Northwest Territory is a subject most of us know nothing about. And until I embarked on this project, I knew nothing about it. But it's been a perfect example for me of still wanting to work at these things my own way. I don't do any research in advance except enough to get started so that I'm as ignorant of what may happen in chapter nine as the reader is. And that's the way I want it because I don't want to be so far sighted <coughs> that I'm acting as though the people who were involved were farsighted. There's no such thing as the foreseeable future. That's one of the lessons of history. Nobody knew how it was going to come out. When I read well, why he should have thought of this and don't know that, hell no. He was in the midst of it. She was in the midst of it. And <coughs> when, I, when I got going on this, I thought the Northwest Territory was Washington and Oregon and that part of the country. The Northwest Territory was land that belonged to Britain, which they ceded to us after the end of the Revolution. And that incredible decision was brought off by John Adams and John Hay um, at the, at the uh, peace treaty in Paris that ended the war. Unbelievable. That area in, in, in acreage, in square miles, 
is as large as all of the original 13 colonies. So we doubled the size of the country, and it, out of it would come five states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Bigger than all of France. And it was nothing but forest, nothing but primeval forest. And the question was, how is it going to be settled? Well, the, some of the veterans <coughs> of the revolution who lived here in Massachusetts met and decided they were going to create what they called the Ohio Company. And they were going to go to the government, which still was a primitive state. We didn't even have a constitution yet and get them to create the basic formula, basic outline of government for this area. And the one who went down and sold them the idea was one of the most remarkable men of the 18th century, that remarkable century. His name was Manessa Cutler, and he lived up here in Hamilton. Uh, he was the pastor of the church there. The church is still there. The, the uh, parsonage is still there. He is buried in the graveyard across the street. Now, Manessa Cutler was a doctor, medical doctor, a lawyer, and a preacher. A, a, a doctoral degrees in all three professions, imagine. Besides that, he was a botanist, and an astronomer, and one of the most remarkable men intellectually of the 18th century. A, 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 a brilliant in every way. He was probably second only to Benjamin Franklin. So they sent him down to New York to, to um, persuade Congress to go, take this on. He'd never done anything like it. He went alone and he pulled it off. And what they insisted there be and this is so important, and this is based on the fact that they are of Puritan background. There would be no, uh, there would be complete religious freedom in all the states that would emerge from this territory. There would be public supported education for everybody, including at the university level. No state in the country yet had anything like that. And, and most important of all, there'd be no slavery. When it went through, that meant that half of our country, before we even had a president, they didn't pass the Constitution until later that same summer, 18, 1787. Before we even had a full government in place, slavery had been banned in what constituted half of the country. And we owe that to those people. And we owe it in large part to their Puritan background, their Puritan ideals. And I've discovered, as maybe some of you have, that the Puritans were not people who dressed all in black and didn't want anyone to ever have any fun. Um, they liked to sing, they liked to dance, they liked to drink. They didn't just wear black. And of course, which, which direction? Some of the earliest of them were right here in this church. and. Um, and we can be very thankful for that background. And they would fight for this all through the next 50 some years because there were strong uh, elements trying to break that no slavery rule, including, I'm all sorry to say, Thomas Jefferson. And they kept fighting for it and they held their ground and there never was, never would be any slavery in all the Northwest Territory. And that's all coming out of this part of the country and the background of those people. Now, I can only tell this story because I found this treasure trove trunk in the attic, if you will, of papers, letters, diaries, such as you could hardly imagine, all in the library of the little college, Marietta College in Marietta, in Marietta Ohio. Marietta is the first town they settled. And what a story it is. And it's today half the size of Hingham in population, about 13,000 people. And the woman who runs that collection, 
her name is Linda Showater, is phenomenal. And I tell students, when you go into a library, when you go into an archive or a historical society to look at what they have, remember that the people who work there are as important and valuable as the material you're going to find. Always tell a librarian of what you're trying to do. Always. When I first started work on the research for the Johnstown flood, I was an English major in college. I had only the history that was required, which I'm glad it was required. I'm a great believer in required courses. I really am. You know, 80% of the colleges and universities in the country now no longer require his, any history for graduation. Absolutely terrible thing to do. I'm, I'm for that, I'm for required courses for that reason, but I'm also, I think it's important that people at that stage in life learn that some things in life are required. <laughs> it isn't all just what you want. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, the, the value of what's in the heads of the librarians is often as important or more important than the actual collections. Judy's, Judy's shift at, uh, at uh, the Yale Library, when that lady retires, it's going to be as if one of their major collections walked out the door. That's how much she knows. The problem today is you go into a library and they'll have young assistants working there. And you ask, I, I want to see everything you have on Augustus St. Gaudens. So they say, yeah, thank you very much. Just a minute. They go bing, bing, bing on the computer. Then zing, 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 out comes a printed thing about what they have on Augustus St. Gaudens. And they don't know anything about who Augustus St. Gaudens was. Whereas if you ask to see one of the older, more established libraries, They'll know an, a tremendous about Augustus St. Gaudens and what they have in the collection, but they'll also know what other things one ought to look at. Very often, in trying to fathom the character, the nature of one of your principal characters in a book, it's the secondary characters who give you the most information. And they are often people that are in the wings, so to speak, in memory. And they're, they're letters and diaries. Now, in this project that I'm doing now, first of all, let me say, say thing that I've always wanted to write a book about people you've never heard of and see if I can get you into the tent without relying on a historic celebrity. I loved, from the time I first saw it or read it, Thornton Wilder's Our Town. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could do Our Town only with real people? And because what I'm really trying to do is to tell a story. I'm not an historian. I, people call me an historian. I don't think of myself as a historian. I'm a writer, a story type writer. I write stories, but they're not made up. There's nothing in them, to my knowledge, that is fictitious. I can't just say the yellow streetcar came, came along and picked him up at 6.30 in the morning. If I don't know it was a yellow streetcar, it might have been a red streetcar, a white streetcar. But I have to know. But I also want to know a great deal more than what many historians and biographers are primarily looking for. I want to know what did their voice sound like? What color were their eyes? What bad habits did they have? When were they deflated by when they, how, how and why they failed at something? How did they address defeat? How did they respond to other people who didn't necessarily act helpfully? All of that. What did they love? What was their primary aspiration? What did they consider a good life? The writing of the Wright brothers, for example. I realized the importance of the father who taught them to have purpose in life. That the good life was a life with purpose and worthy purpose. So they were never working for money. They made a lot of money, but that never was the reason they were so devoted to their way. They felt they were on a mission. And they said so. And of course, that had a large part to do with changing, changing history. The Wright brothers, by the way, like so many of the characters in my book that I'm writing now about the Ohio settlers, 
had little or no formal education. They never went to college. They never finished high school. And um, they had no, taken no courses in physics or mathematics, high math, high math, and none of that. So all of these young people today who want to get into technologically advancing professions or jobs are naturally taking all that and abandoning the humanities. Here are the two people who cracked one of the most difficult technical problems of all time, who were, who were liberal arts majors, if you will, in high school. They, had, they lived in a house that had no running water with their father. Mother had died. It had no central heat. It had no electricity. It had no indoor plumbing. But it was full of books because the father was a great reader. It's full of whole sets of Mark Twain and Shakespeare and so forth. And he encouraged them to read and to read above their level. And told them, learn to use the English language on your feet and on paper, and you don't have to worry much beyond that. It's still true. Still true that, that the liberal arts are essential. Information isn't learning. Information is in plentiful as we've never known it. If information were learning, if you memorized the World Almanac, you, you wouldn't be educated. You'd be weird. <laughs> Young people today, unfortunately, don't really need to know an awful lot because they can look it up. Why look it up? No, their vocabulary is diminishing. And that's all measurable. I have a character in the book I'm writing now who never went to, he finished school when he was about 16 maybe or less. He couldn't go to college because his father, because of the state of the economy then, after the revolution. He couldn't spell, but what a vocabulary he had. Phenomenal. He uses words occasionally, I'm not sure I know the, the correct meaning. and. He would not give up, no matter how uh, the adversities he faced. His name is Ephraim Cutler. He was the son of Manasseh Cutler. But while Manasseh Cutler was up as a minister in, in Hamilton and, and associating with all kinds of brilliant people, including the presidents of Harvard and so forth, and with scientists from over, uh, by letter by scientists for scientists abroad, this boy's uncle had died when he was fairly young, and his name was Ephraim. And they asked the father, Ephraim, the, or Manessa, the minister, if they could take their little six-year-old boy and raise him because they'd lost their child. And he was named Ephraim for the man who had died. And they, he grew up on a farm in Connecticut where they had virtually nothing. So he couldn't go to college. He didn't have any schooling. And even when he was a grown man out in Ohio, struggling with everything he had to survive out there, his father would, and he was writing to his father, his father would write back correcting his spelling and his grammar and so forth. And this marvelous man didn't get touchy and, and hurt about it. He just thanked his father very much. Um, to have that life come, come alive is one of the joys of this work. You're bringing these people back to life. We have an expression called gone but not forgotten. My feeling, strong feeling is if they're not forgotten, they're not gone. And that's my mission in life, to bring these people back to living with us. And in many ways, you get to know them better than you know people in real life. Truly, because for one thing, in real life, you don't get to read other people's mail. <laughs> and of course, today, nobody writes any letters anymore. I don't know how future historians are going to write about us. Really, if you have any interest in immortality, start keeping a diary and write letters to somebody every day 
And when you get to the point where you think maybe the curtain's going to come down, give it to this collection here. And it'll be quoted for hundreds of years because it'll be the only collection of letters and diaries in existence. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy this kind of chance to talk with people about my work and how I do it. I can't close without telling you one thing very important. I believe that any time you write something that you're serious about, get somebody to read it aloud for you, because then you hear things about it that you don't necessarily see, particularly you've been looking at day after day on paper. You hear when you're using the same word too often. You hear when your um, sentence structure is getting tiresome. You hear when you're being boring and you don't want that. Uh, so everything that I've ever written, Rosalie has read aloud to me. And reading aloud isn't just once, it's often three, four or five times because when you get toward the end of the book, you know much more than you knew when you started and you want to go back and rewrite. I tell people, don't strive to be a writer, learn to be a rewriter because that's where it gets up to the point where it works. And keep in mind all the five senses, smell, sight, sound, feeling. And don't ever think of history as a lot of facts and quotations you have to memorize. It's about people. It's about human people. Get to the humanity at the center of each individual. Jefferson said, when it went in the course of human events. That's what it is, human events. And when Rosalie reads, I, I, I know if it's all right, not just from the expression on her face, <laughs> but sometimes she'll tell me. When I was finishing one of the chapters in the Theodore Roosevelt book, she was reading it aloud. She got me and said, there's something wrong with that sentence. I said, well, read it again. So she read it again. I said, she, I said, there's nothing wrong with that sentence. She said, yes, there is. I said, give me that. So I took it back and I, I read it to her. I said, see how what I mean? She said, no, there's something wrong with that sentence. I said, well, just keep going. So she kept going and the book went to the publisher eventually and it was published and was reviewed in the New York Review of Books by Gore Vidal. And in the review, he said, I can't quote it exactly. Um, However, sometimes Mr. McCullough doesn't write very well. <laughs> Consider this sentence. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Stand up. Stand up. There she is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>